I'm, I'm Juan Campo on the Faculty of Religious Studies here at UCSB. And this is my good friend Sam Cotty, the producer of this film, a Hollywood uh, and Syrian uh, writer and director as well, a filmmaker, obviously. And, uh, and tonight we're going to explore some of the uh, 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 themes connected with the film, but also look at some, uh, how such a creative person uh, came about and what his background is from his, you know, how his background is reflected in his work and things like that in his, in his filmmaking. So, um, uh, so Sam, we have uh, two, you know, engaging narratives, two stories uh, of Lamia and Jalal, or Jalal al-Din Rumi, and uh, who are refugees. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the headlines in the newspapers today, we can find, if we look carefully, we can find lots of refugee stories. I can remember even back in, in 2015, we had this uh, three-year-old child uh, who, whose body washed up on the shore of, of Turkey, Syrian, right. Aylan Kurdi yeah, like was his name. Yeah. And, uh, and that produced lots of concern and attention to the plight of the refugees. But I was wondering in terms of you know, your background and your you know, in, in developing this, this animated feature, how you chose the story of Lamia is there a real Lamia? How he chose to put that story together with Rumi's uh, story? Yeah, actually, first of all, thank you so much for, for having me and thank you so much for, for, for being here. And, and it's a privilege and honor to, to share our work with you. And thanks for Carsey Wolf uh, program and everybody involved to, to having us here. Uh, Rumi is, I mean, Lamia is real. Uh, it's based actually on a, on a actual Lamia that the writer actually met at a refugee camp. Uh, and uh, he was absolutely stunned to uh, know that she was at that time reading Rumi inside that refugee camp. And he, he was really definitely taken by, that fa by, by the fact that these kids over there, uh, they're, they're trying to to find their own life and their own way, and they're trying to recover from their own trauma by using poetry, and you know the the, the healing power of, of poem and, and, and poetry, and that definitely you know moved and moved Alex Alex Kernemer, uh, incredible writer, and he's the director as well, and uh, then the idea of like. At that time, there was really not a real story because he was trying to to find out like how would we like if we want to you know uh, display that story of a refugee girl reading Rumi in you know during these difficult circumstances, what would be the connection? So he was doing you know a little bit of research, and then he found out that actually Rumi was a refugee you know, uh, during his times uh, back in, you know, in the 13th century because of the Mongol and immediately clicked. Like, it's like two magic. refugees, absolutely, it's like magic, two refugees from, you know, across time meeting somehow in, in an imaginary world. We have to create that world. So this is where, you know, that kind of created this, what we call magical realism of you know, how about we tell that type of story. And, and uh, he wrote an early draft that he, he ran by me. And I, I've known Alex for years and years. But Alex, uh, he normally uh, works on, on documentaries, uh, and, and mainly like kind of like PBS documentaries. Um, and I've known him since I got into the, you know, into, since I went actually to film school back in Michigan. And, uh, and we became friends. But I, I'm, when I started getting into the, you know, the, the real world of, of, of filmmaking, I always do like, you know, kind of like the commercial films, the mainstream films, with the subjects that I choose. So we always say we're going to collaborate. One day we'll do a project together. So when he thought, okay, this is a, hopefully an idea that, you know, let me run it, you know, by Sam. Especially knowing also my background, you know, as far as I was, you know, uh, for if people don't know, I was born in, in Aleppo in Syria, where Lemia was was born and, and, and raised. 
and the minute I, I read the first draft, I, I called Alex and I was like, oh my God, you know, I mean, definitely I have a, tons of notes. I have tons of things to talk to you about, but let's talk about this. And, and honestly, I wasn't sure at the beginning, like what would be the involvement, but just as a friend, I wanted to help and I wanted this story to be told. And then, uh, you know, I started sharing notes with him just because I'm, I was so passionate about this. I mean, it's Rumi, and I mean, we all love Rumi, but then Lamia and Syria and refugees, and so topical and so timely. So then he's like, Sam, can you, you know, produce it? Would you come on board and, and you know, lead the way and, and produce it? And, and the rest was history, so we started working on it together. So, so, but you conceived of it as an animated film from the beginning, or did you have an yeah, idea? Yeah, I think, be a yeah, yeah, it was, it was quickly, it was quickly, we, we realized this is an animation film because of, you know, I think some, uh, you know, budgeting issues, and, and at the same time, we wanted to have the freedom of, of uh, let just our, you know, imagination just kind of like flow and, 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 and and organically just go places that where it's not constrained by the budget and what we want to do. And, and we wanted to really access, have access to, you know, young teenagers and, 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 you know, and even though maybe it's not appropriate for kids, but I say maybe 10 and up, they could watch it. So we thought the animation, you know, uh, platform could be a perfect mm -hmm. platform for it. Uh, something I haven't done before, neither Alex, but we dove into it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we didn't really know that COVID was about to happen. Uh, so we started working on it and we, you know, we have uh, our animators all in Canada. They're Canadian animators. And, you know, when we got to the real work, it was during COVID, but so we had to actually mobilize all our animators and ask him to work from home. So the workflow was very, very uh, kind of like slow. Uh, but two years during COVID, we were, we were working on this and I was just sharing with, with Dr. Juan when we were in the green room that uh, after two years, me and Alex uh, working over Zoom, the first time we met after two years was at the film, at the premiere at Annecy Film Festival in, in France. And I walked in, I remember, to the lobby of the hotel, and, and he was sitting there waiting for me. And it was incredibly surreal. I could not believe it. I was like, do you realize we haven't seen each other for two years, and we've been working on this, and right now we're here to watch it at the largest and, and most you know, prestigious, kind of like animation film festival in the world on the biggest screen. And this, is, this can't be real. And you know, he gave me a big hug, and, you know, and we, you know, we got ready for the premiere. And, and that was actually a week after France opened their borders to let. So we, we weren't even sure if we could even make it there. Yeah. You know, so it, it came together. Somehow we managed to pull it off. It was magic. Magic, absolutely <laughs> magic. Absolutely. Well, actually, getting back to the animated quality of it, it's, it's as you're right, the magical realism is, is very effective and impacting. This is the third time I've seen it. And there are just some scenes and images that remain with me over time, whether it's the fireflies mm -hmm. or the, you know, they kind of occur as a motif throughout the film or the reed flute kind of tottering right. Right. or the, the monstrous figures, you know, whether it's the, the, Mo the Mongol <laughs> jackal army yeah. or this giant dragon that comes out of the right. ice and things like that. Just uh, the storm at sea, you know, I mean, all these things. Uh, it's just a tremendous... And, and we want it to be different. We, we, I mean, we don't want to present, a, you know, a, a, a Disney film. I mean, and nothing wrong with Disney films. I mean, I, I grew up with Disney films, but we, we just f thought the, you know, the style, uh, you know, that, we, that fits our story best is, is, is something a little different, something a little artsy, something that, you know, uh, it takes you a while until you get into it. You know, I know it's, it's sometimes... You know, when, I remember when I started sharing it with people that I know, and they know the type of films I make. I think, even though they knew it's animation, but I think the first five minutes is like, it's like, you know, this is different type of, like, like it takes you a little bit until, which is you know, a little bit of discomfort at the beginning, but that's fine, that's fine, and, and that's, that's, that's intentional. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely we worked carefully, I mean, my one of my biggest you know parts or impact on the film was 
also making sure that it is very authentic when it comes to the Syrian story. Uh, these streets that you're seeing on the, you know, in the film, these streets that I know, these are streets that I, uh, you know, that I've, I've walked through. Uh, when Lemia is looking through the window, seeing like the kind of like bird eye view of Aleppo, this is exactly like, this is a window where, like, because I was, I remember talking to Alex, like when we started getting some sketches and, you know, at early stage, and I was like, no, if you go to that time, if you want to, talk about the area that was bombed first. Hmm. You know, this is the, you know, the old, it's the old city in Aleppo. Wow. And if she will be looking through that window, she won't be seeing this. She will be seeing this. So it has to be. So definitely we drove the animators crazy by, by, the, <laughs> by these details. It's like, well, these wires, electrical wires, they're not straight in Aleppo. Are you kidding me? Just drop them. You know, that kind of stuff, yeah. you know, what's inside the house. I think these details, I always look at it as a, like a painting that it's hard for you to figure what's the reason behind every paintbrush. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it and you see it, I just love it. I don't really know what's the reason, but that's how we want it to be as authentic as possible. So I noticed even some of the shops had Arabic names on them. If you read Arabic, one of them is called Halwiyat Isra. Oh, yeah, that's true. Is that true. the name of one of the that's sweet true. shops? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, sweet yeah. shop, yeah. Isra sweet uh, shop. Absolutely. Actually, <laughs> there is a sign for a dentist that I, actually my mother-in-law used to go to that dentist. You know, when, you know, uh, so it's, it's kind of like funny, like the stuff that I threw in there and I asked yeah. our animators, I'll send them photos, like, can we recreate this? Can we do yeah. this? Because again, it's, it's just, you know, it's authentic, especially if something you know, you wanna, you wanna make sure that, uh, yeah, like it's, it's responsibility. Mm -hmm. it's, every frame is a responsibility mm -hmm. and of the entire team, it's not just uh, you know, my, my, myself. So, so tell us what was happening in Aleppo in 2015, you know, when this, these scenes with Lamia are taking place at the beginning of the film. What was, what was happening? Who were those, who were those jet planes belong to that were bombing the people? Yeah, I mean, definitely this is, um, I mean, at that time, I mean, the uprising took place back in 2000, uh, back in 2011, early, like March 2011. And, you know, uh, it definitely it took the first eight months was, it was a peaceful, uh, kind of like peaceful demonstrations. The people over there, they were not even demanding uh, uh, a change of a regime. They were demanding more you know, uh, just their basic, you know, rights and, you know, freedom of speech, uh, the equal distribution of wealth, uh, the emergency laws that's been there and was there for like 25 years to drop because there was no reason for it. And we, the government over there always want you to feel as if we are at war. Mm -hmm. And we were not at war. So this like, is the why Syrian the, government. That's the Syrian government, you know, since 19, like, you know, 73. And they have these emergency rules that actually you could be taken to jail for, you know, and you don't have even the, the right to have an attorney. And, and it will be actually more than uh, kind of like an army style type of, you know, uh, you know, kind of like um, ruling and so, so a lot of things. But then I think when the regime treated these protests with, uh, with a lot of violence and uh, then, you know, it definitely it took different direction and, uh, and it became more an, an, an armed movement. Uh, and definitely for the people, you know, interested to know more about this, I, I, I made a film called Little Gandhi. And, you know, Little Gandhi is a little bit, you know, more difficult to watch, definitely, than, than Lemia's poem. I have some questions and, about that. So. And, yeah, so that's, that takes you literally through the history of what happened in Syria, not in 2000, starting 2011, but actually going back 2008, what was the ambient and the environment and why people decided to, you know, to march the streets of, of, of Syria. And I take you, you know, through the first kind of like, you know, few years of the uprising there. And it's a feature length documentary is available. You can, you know, stream it and, and, and look at it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I don't want to reduce the story of Lamia down to those years. Mm -hmm. these, those Syrian jet planes could have been, you know, any, any uh, aggressor uh, or force of aggression that causes refugee po populations to flow as well as natural catastrophes. We had the portrayal of the Mongols as well. So right. there's kind of an archetypal element of the, all the evil forces that can, bring, and that can bring about destruction and 
cause these huge refugee flows? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's it's different times uh, and 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 same results, unfortunately. And and like if it's the Mongol, if it's the Assad regime, or of what's going on in the world, and what's going on in Ukraine, and what's going on in Iraq and Libya, and and now in you know Israel and Palestine, it, it's just it feels like we're not learning anything. Literally, we're not learning anything. I mean, I mean, and we, you know, and uh, we, we thought it's like never again, but it keeps on happening again and again and again because, you know, we, we have one failed policy after another, after another, and the international community definitely dropped the ball long time ago. And I feel as, as just average people, we've been manipulated, we've been tricked. Uh, you know, we've been, we've been fed with so much anger and so much hate and so much, I mean, dividedness to the point that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to talk to somebody and have a really a proper dialogue on, and, and proper discussion. But if you look through the history, we lived together for, 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 for hundreds of years and, and we lived peacefully, you know, together. And, but it's, it's just right now, it's, f it's hard to find really an adult in, in that big room in that political room that could bring us all together that you know uh, I mean politicians which is you know maybe the least favorite people uh, <laughs> because yet to find really a politician with sort of decency that could you know just say one thing and believe in or just turn his humanity the humanity clock turn it on or switch turn it on and just stick to one thing and not flip-flopping and not just Say things just to serve his own you know, his own agenda, and 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 the results is like seeing kids, uh, basically you know taking death boats, and people ask you like, how come like why would they you know be on a boat like how would you take your kids on a boat to cross the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean for instance, knowing that you know 70% you're not gonna make it. Well, because if he stays where he is or he was, the chances are 90% he's not going to make it. So, so we can't blame these people for the decision they make. And, and then we put these kids in danger and, and families, unfortunately. And basically in Syria, I mean, we, 13 million displaced people, half of them are refugees and half of them displaced internally. It's, it contributes actually to the 110 millions that we yeah. talked about at the beginning or the shelter box, you know, Paul mentioned uh, 110 million, you know, displaced people around the world. Syria, it actually comes as like number one. Uh, so it, 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 it breaks your heart for sure, you know, on but a daily basis. As bad as things are though, it seems that your, your film is trying to give us some hope. Well, we, we right, looked you're trying for, to give us a message. Yeah, about. absolutely. We looked for this letter of hope, how we can find it. And we found it really in Rumi and in, in his statements, the wound is the place where the light enters you. And I think that was a it's huge amazing. inspiration because we thought it's like, you know, this is exactly what we're looking for. You know, despite the challenges, despite the difficulties, Despite the tear and, and you know and, and these kids are dying on daily basis and, and the, the people that they're getting slaughtered for no reason, there is a light. It must be a light through that wound that's gonna come through. And this is where I you know we were really moved. Like yes, we need to make this this film and we need mm -hmm. to honor and preserve that that quote by Rumi about mm -hmm. that really that really the, the wound is, is the place where the light, the light enters happens. you mm -hmm. through these difficulties. Mm -hmm. The light is going to come through and mm -hmm. it's going to shine. Mm -hmm. And it's going to shine sooner or later. Mm -hmm. We like it, we don't like it, or people, you know, whoever don't like it, it's, it's going to shine mm -hmm. and it's going to be bright. It's going to be bright and it's going to be beautiful. It's amazing. Uh, your, your earlier film, the, the little uh, Gandhi documentary mm -hmm. film, as you said, uh, made at the time of the Syrian uh, popular uprising. This is part of the Arabic Spring wave that uh -huh. swept so many Middle Eastern countries. Sure. The hopes that people could change uh, their their lives and change their existence and improve it through uh, popular protest. And uh, Little Gandhi contains a key idea in the film. Despite this destruction, there is this 25-year-old youth mm -hmm. who grew up different from anybody else, 
but decided to take a non-violent confrontation with the most vicious security forces and police in Syria by offering them a white rose and a bottle of water That's true. In, in their demonstrations. That's true. Can and you talk about this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Little Gandhi is, is the story of, uh, of Giyath Matar. He, he, he inspired, you know, thousands of people in Syria and then millions around the world with his peace movement uh, uh, that's basically handing roses and, 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 and water bottles to the to the security forces that they were shooting at him. And he was inspired with his group in the suburb of, of Damascus in Daraya. Uh, they were inspired by Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And, and, and I remember when I, when, I, when I knew about this story, I, I was familiar with Giyat Matar because I heard his story as a, as a peace activist early, at early you know, times uh, in 2011. And, uh, but then when I heard that he was really inspired by Martin Luther King, not just Mahatma Gandhi, and I was like, what are the odds? Like, do we even know here, like sitting in the United States, that we have somebody in the suburb of Damascus sitting in a little town, he was moved by Martin Luther King and believed in Martin Luther King with him and his group, and they decided to lead a peace movement. And he knew since day one that he's gonna pay his life for it. He knew it. You know, there were documents, there are things that he wrote. He knew he, he, that he's gonna, you know, they're gonna execute him. And, and he, he went on, on the run and he was hiding and he will show up and protest and he will organize things and, and inspire so many people in, in, uh, around Syria. But then the government actually ended up trapping him, set a trap for him and they captured him and they tortured him to death. And he was only 25 years old. And at that time, Washington Post gave him the nickname of Little Gandhi because he was just so young. It's not little with his action. Definitely his action was, was, was way, way bigger than, than anything I can, I can say and describe. But because he was so young and moved millions around the world and you know, his funeral in the suburb of Damascus we're talking, you know, like right in the middle of the, you know, the, the actually the, the violence and the uprising in Syria and uh, 12 ambassadors actually showed up at his funeral, you know, led by the, the U.S. Ambassador, ambassador Robert Ford, which, he, you know, he was featured in the film as well. So uh, it was, it was a, an incredible journey, the, you know, making that documentary, which was, that was my first, you know, featured documentary. Uh, a lot of difficulties, and, and I ended up doing a, a TED talk, uh, you know, about how this film actually changed my life, changed my priority in life, uh, and how did we manage to actually do this film, and, you know, shooting in a, in a besieged area, uh, and this is before COVID, we're talking now 2016, but we managed to shoot the part in Syria as actually from Istanbul remotely by training people inside the besieged, the besieged city. And I direct, directed them over Skype. There was no Zoom at that time with my group from Istanbul at the Hilton where we had our suite as our like, you know, the, the war room, the control room. And we will connect with them in, in a magical way. And so many, like this, the system is, it was incredible just how to do this thing. And, and we managed to, to shoot that film over there and it took months and months because these activists will f all of a sudden they disappear and we think maybe they're killed and then they show up after a week and they say we're available again, we can talk again and we did this. And talk about how they, how they got the film out of Syria. And then, I, <laughs> and then <laughs> little I knew at that time I thought because we are, you know, we're talking over the internet, they will be able to, definitely, we, so we trained the cinematographer, we trained that DP over there, that director of photography, because he was just a photographer, to shoot the footage that needs to match our footage, because we shot also part of it in Turkey and part of it in the United States. But then I thought they could upload this footage for us at the end to get that footage. And then when, I mean, after we wrapped everything, I realized somebody told me, "Is like, well, if you want us to upload it, we'll upload it, but it's going to take about seven years for you to get the footage. <laughs> because based on the speed of the internet at that area, he said we could upload up to one gig a week. <laughs> and I was like, one gig, it equals almost a one second for me. 
Okay, well, that's a good math. Uh, so, but then, you know, we had to wait about six, seven months and, uh, until, you know, a few activists over there, uh, they volunteered to smuggle the footage on small thumb drives underground uh, to, to try to get it to the other side, to like Damascus, and then smuggle it to Lebanon. And even in Lebanon, I, I told them it's not safe, so try to put it on a hard drive and get it to Turkey, and they smuggled it to Turkey, and then with Turkey we got the, you know, the footage and, and shipped to me uh, to actually to Santa Barbara, and we did the entire editing actually in Santa Barbara here. And my, you know, we did that, the we, and the film ended up running for an Oscar. So, that was good. Yeah. Uh, you like to pick challenging projects. <laughs> Do, doing, uh, doing this uh, little Gandhi during the Syrian civil war, and then doing Lamia's poem during COVID. <laughs> Yeah, I think I had a, it's funny, I had a Variety magazine, they reached out to me, you know, uh, they, you know, after COVID, and there's like, okay, hold on just a second. So basically, you made a movie <laughs> remotely, you finished it in 2017, now your second film, you started the movie, and now everybody working from home, you're doing it over Zoom. Are you going to be on set one day? You know, <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, let's talk about this. So we were ch chatting about, you know, that experience, because they were trying to see that experience versus now people trying to figure out how we're gonna shoot things remotely. I was like, I'll tell you, you know, I've done it. I've done it three, three years ago. So it's unfortunate. This is not how we want to make films, but it's, I, I think it, it shows you, and it's not just me, I'm just one person. That's a huge team that we work together, but it shows you that how, how resilient, you know, human beings are and, and, and how adaptable we are. And when, when you have the will, you, you have, you know, the way. Find to a way yeah. um, tell us about your own background in terms of how you got into, you know, your involvement with film. Uh, you, were, you grew up in Syria. Hmm. The Middle East has a very lively film production history going back to the 1920s and 30s. Hmm. Egypt. Egypt is a major center Absolutely. for that. Yeah. Lebanon was for a while, but the Civil War interrupted mm -hmm. that. But Iraq and other Arab countries had their own yeah. cinemas. But uh, how did you get involved, you know, in terms of the filmmaking and things like that growing up. So, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it wasn't meant to be, to be, to be honest. Uh, I, I remember I was always uh, busy with sports for the most part. Uh, but then, uh, but since I was really a little kid, I, I used to love watching movies, you know, black and white movies. I used to, you know, memorize, you know, some musicals and do some stuff and watch a lot of films and write a lot actually and a lot of poetry, a lot of poem, and a lot of stuff. But then I think I got busy with sports for so long. But then when I got into college, uh, I think the first year of college, I used to have a group of friends that we used to sit and, and chat before, you know, the professor you know, walks in and the instructor or whatever. And it looks like there is that one person. And uh, I wrote actually a story about that individual later on. That was my, my, my essay to get into film school. So that individual, he used to sit near us, like he will sit like a couple, couple rows in front of us, just listening to us because we were, you know, a bunch of funny individuals. <laughs> so, and I, it looks like I used to lead the way by, you know, dropping jokes and telling things and blah, and this guy used to enjoy this. So when we show up early, he will show up early and he will sit close by just to have some fun and enjoyment or whatever. And I think a few months after that, one time, you know, after we, you know, we finished the entire lecture, he stopped me. I mean, I know I'm familiar with his face, but I didn't really know who he is. I still remember his name and last name until this minute. And he said, Sam, this is me. This is my name. And I, he said, I, I have something to share with you. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And he's like, uh, four years from now when we graduate, because that was the first year, uh, if if I see you an engineer and not an entertainer or an artist or somehow, you know, a filmmaker or a storyteller, I'm going to be extremely sad. And he walks away. <laughs> and I was just puzzled. I was like, what? <laughs> it's like, where did that come from? And literally, I kept thinking about it for, uh, for a few weeks. And this is actually kind of like the story I wrote uh, when I entered film school. 
I, sub I had to submit kind of like a, sh a short story or something. And it's like, I call them like the stranger that, that you have to listen to. I mean, there's always these strangers in our life that, you know, you either pay attention to or you don't pay attention to. And they might drop a line that might change completely your, you know, your life. It's up to you if you listen to them or if you ignore them. And at that time, I really paid attention to that person. And I went... And I was like, let me try to see, like, maybe this guy is for real. Uh, I don't really know. Maybe he's a magician. I have no idea. So I went, I remember, uh, that was my first year of college, engineering school. And I said, uh, I walked into the, actually, the theater group they used to get together. We had theater group at the engineering college. And I said, if you guys need any actor, you know, I love to audition. I, you know, I want to just be, you know, part of your group if possible. And they said, yeah, actually, we have a few seniors that are about to leave, and we're gonna, we're putting together an audition. You can show up on such and such a date, and and we'll audition you. And I was like, okay. Uh, and I showed up, and and he said, oh, well, you're actually good. So I said, actually, I can also write a little bit. I was like, really? What can you write? So I wrote a skit small skit, and I was like, huh, we like that skit. Okay, how about we'll give you a lead in just five minutes, small skit. We try you, you know, in, in a play that we are about to do. And I got involved with them, and the rest was history. I got involved, and then a few years later, I became the lead of that theater group, and I, that I started writing, and I, you know, full plays and, uh, and, um, and uh, directing and playing the leads. And then I was recruited to do another theater group and different in the engineering in, in the College of Science uh, because it's a different setup school in Syria at that time. It's like a one, like University of Aleppo has like almost 60,000 students and they have every single specialty. So it's like, it's like my engineering school where like about 6,000 people. So we have our own theater group. Uh, but then I, I ended up like for like seven, eight years, I wrote about 18 plays that I wrote, directed, and played the lead in every single one of them. Wow. <laughs> well, you've Typical Middle East and want to do everything. You've, you've given us a great model to consider in terms of bringing together the sciences and humanities here at UCSB. Yeah, yeah, here you go, here you go. Unfortunately, we don't have theater groups in our engineering school. I see. Well, I might think, be a good idea. I think you should, maybe you should start that. And this is actually, and at the end, there was a play that I did in Syria that ended up winning some awards. And then all of a sudden, actually, I ended up getting an invitation to do that play in the United States. And this is how I came to the United States, to Michigan. Actually, I, you know, one of the plays that I wrote was acquired. And they want me to come with that play. And this is how I, you know, entered the the United States, and, and, then, the States. and then, yeah, it was funny, I was in Aleppo, and they, I remember, like, oh, I'm gonna go to the United States, I'm like, extremely, you know, uh, happy, and actually, I, I was about to get paid also for the place, like, whoa, it's like, what is, what is going on here, what is that guy, he told me you should be an entertainer or something, so I was, like, really happy, but then I remember, it's a, it's a funny thing, actually, they said, Oh, your uh, your visa actually, it's uh, you know, it didn't come through. And I was like, what happened? I was talking to you know, they connected me with somebody. They said, well, at that time, they were saying the union of the actors in New York actually haven't approved it yet, which is kind of like SAG. <laughs> and now I know what it is. And I was like, what's the union? Like, are they like? I'm gonna like what? I'm gonna compete with Michael Douglas? I was like, guys, what? I mean, I'm just going there for a play. Like, why do you need the union of the in Hollywood? You know, it's like, yeah, they you need an approval. Then we got the approval later. But I was like, what are we? Like, I was a little kid. Literally, the first country I've ever traveled to, and the first plane I jumped onto to, to fly it was to the United States. Oh. That was, that was kind of like, you know, and you could, you know, like a little kid in a candy shop, for sure. Speaking of which, you had an image of the United States before you came here that you gained mm. from watching American movies, right? Can you tell us about your, your experience with American movies in Aleppo and Syria? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's always, it's, uh, it feels like the two-sided. You have the dreamland and you have the horror part of it, where you're gonna be shot anywhere you're gonna go. Don't go to Chicago, don't go to Chicago, they're gonna shoot you. you know, it's, right. like, it's like not knowing, well, there are streets in every, you know, it's like that kind of, but at the, at the same time, it was, you know, 
the dreamland and the American dream. And, and it's always uh, something of, you know, I, I thought it's like, if there is a place that I want it to be, will be, you know, the United States to, you know, seek my dreams. And, and I, you know, little I knew that I will, few years, you know, after I came here, I actually ended up making a movie called The Citizen. It's a drama. It's about the American dream. And it's kind of like the, the you know, uh, you know, paying, this is my, the, the tribute that I, you know, to, to the United States and to the American dream that actually uh, kind of like made my dream come true, but in the, true, but at the same time it was challenging because, uh, you know, 9-11, you know, basically, you know, happened and, and I went through my own challenges as an immigrant and, you know, from the Middle East and, uh, but, you know, nobody said it's going to be easy mm -hmm. and it's still not easy and we still, you know, fighting through it, if it's over Skype, over Zoom, underground, on the, you know, we'll, 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 we'll make it. Are there any American filmmakers that uh, you admire and sort of inspire you in terms of your own? Yeah, I'm definitely I'm, I'm Mari, I'm Martin Scorsese. Uh -huh. Martin Scorsese. I, it's, it's funny, actually. You know, I've met a lot of actors and a lot of directors and a lot of... Uh, so, you know, that, that star kind of like uh, struck kind of like, uh -huh. uh, you know, elements. Uh, I remember I'm a member with the, the Directors Guild and I'm, uh, in Los Angeles. So I remember one time I was going to Martin Scorsese film and a Q&A. So he was supposed uh -huh. to be there and I knew he's going to be there, but I didn't know that I'm gonna end up in the elevator, me and him <laughs> and his friend. And he, I admire him so much to the point I, for 30 seconds, I did not even say a single word. I was just looking at him and doors open, he stepped out, and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Why didn't I even say hi? It's like, what? You know, and at that time I was still a director, but early in my, you know, my career, this is how much I, I love Scorsese. And maybe because he's only like five, six or five, seven, I, I love short directors, <laughs> but he's incredible. He's like, kind of like the director that I always look up, uh, you know. So. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, this has been great talking to you. I have one more question I want to sure. ask you, and then we want to open up to the audience for questions. And so I just wanted to ask you what's happening now? What's your next project? What, do you, what are you envisioning doing these days? So uh, I'm working right now on a political drama. What a surprise. Uh, you know, back to some politics. It's an American uh, political uh, drama, uh, even though they like it to, they like to, the distributor like to call it thriller because it sells more is fine uh, but it's it's really it's um, I, I can't say much about it uh, but it's it just deals with actually a presidential uh, campaign and, and a campaign manager uh, and a nominee that they you know they go back all the way to uh, you know their childhood friends and uh, they end up uh, you know they're working together and putting together an incredible and controversial campaign uh, presidential campaign and we just deal with few elements of, you know, of what this country is going through. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this script back in 2000. I, we started writing that script 2012 mm -hmm. and we finished 2014. And at that time, everybody thought that this script is crazy <laughs> and people won't, you know, buy into this. It's very ambitious until a couple of years ago, we started getting phone calls about when did you write this? <laughs> It was like I told you, uh, but anyway, so we're prepping for mm -hmm. this one, and uh, and now, as as most people here know, that there is a strike, uh, writer strike ended, uh, you know, and that's which is great. Uh, actor strike still still happening, so that definitely affected our, you know, our progress. But uh, just the last two weeks, I I got a you know my interim agreement and my waiver to continue with the project, which is great from SAG because. You know, I'm not affiliated with any studio at this point. So we're, now we're back on track to get this uh, film together and hopefully we'll shoot it soon and share it with you. It's a, a heck of a script. It's an incredible story and with some incredible team we're working with. We well, look forward to seeing the result. Looking forward to bringing yeah. it here too. <laughs> Great. Great. So one of, the, one of the most remarkable things about the film, in addition to the visuals and the narrative lines that are in it, is the music. Uh, a kind of haunting, beautiful music with a theme that keeps recurring. Right. And I've heard that the composer of the music is with us tonight, Christopher Willis. 
Chris? Christopher Willis, can you please give a round of applause? Where are you, Christopher? Where are you? I don't see him. Oh, Christopher, oh, right Chris here. Hi. <laughs> so, so Christopher Willis is an award-winning composer. He composed the themes for Veep. Uh, the Death of Stalin, if you've seen that, Black Mirror, and together with his wife, Elise, he's been working on music for Disney short films. So, um, so I'd like to ask you a question, Chris, if you, you don't mind, and that is basically, how was, what was your part you know, in, in syncing the, the music together with the animation in this and during the time of COVID? If you could talk a little bit about that. And what inspired you with the music, too? They'd be, there's a whole... Um a uh, whole saga you could tell about the music, which I won't go into too much detail with, uh, regarding COVID and regarding, you know, the, the, um, uh, the process ever since I read the script and was completely hooked and just felt that this was like nothing I'd experienced before. You know, this was going to be an independent movie that was going to be saying very different things from anything I'd worked on before. Um, but yes, um, COVID made it, made it a real challenge. I realized we were, I was, Sam, I was thinking earlier, Sam and I luckily did meet a few times before COVID hit. We had some very nice meals together and we really bonded and we, we, I felt that we knew each other personally. But I've still never met Alex, the director, in person. <laughs> We works, I mean, it's, COVID is weird, isn't it? You have to actually really think through to decide if you've really worked closely with someone, whether you ever actually saw them, and we didn't. And then we had all of these dramas with the recording the music. I mean, it's so difficult to record music if you can't all get everyone together. Um, we had thought that it, would, that it would be very big, and actually, as we worked on it, we, we realized with the style of the art, um, and the nature of the story. We had, there were so many things we thought we might do, and it, you, you know, in retrospect, it seemed so obvious, but it, it was not obvious. We thought that maybe the, the three worlds would have different kinds of music, and actually, as it evolved, we realized that the, revert, the exact opposite was necessary, that the film is so visually arresting and is so um, sort of cosmic in its scope that actually the, music should, the music's job is to sort of bring everything together and to make everything, to make you feel like everything is actually one story. So we, we moved away from that and, and the, 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 the music became more intimate and we had this string group at the center of it. And we were all set to record the strings in person, making plans in November of 2020 because LA was starting to feel like things were, things were, were getting better. And then there was a second lockdown. There was a really, a very sudden lockdown and we realized we had to cancel all of the recording sessions and we had to, instead of recording the, the group together, um, being able to watch each other and, and respond, we had to record each, mu each musician completely on their own. One at a time, you know, bring one musician in, um, in a different room from me, I'm in one room and they're in another room and just record with one person continuously for like 12 hours and then they finish and the next day another person comes in. And the wonderful, um, Ney playing, so the yes. Persian Ney yes. is very prominent in the score. Um, it's being played by Hussein Umumi. We're very lucky to get him, but one of the best players of the Persian Ney in the world. Um, uh, I actually initially tried to get a session musician that I know to play it, and he kept saying no. He said, no, I'm not good enough. You need a real specialist. And he recommended one person, and we couldn't get that person. And then I asked him again, and he said no again, and recommended some. And eventually, we actually did... Um, find Hussein, um, who is so far removed from movies that we never thought we would get him, so that was a real stroke of luck. But we, were, we made plans to be in the same place and his family didn't want him to travel. So we, we never, I never met Hussein either. We recorded all of that uh, with him recording in his house on, on, on his own mic. Um, so there were many, many, many challenges, but um, it's, yes, very emotional seeing it all come together. There was a sort of persistence that we all had that this is going to work and of course every time I saw footage it looked so beautiful and every time we had a little breakthrough with the music and something really working beautifully we all really felt it even though it was all on zoom so I'm um, just so so glad that it that it, that it came I mean together. just to, to say a few things I mean it, it, Chris is incredibly humble <laughs> as you could tell and and if I say that we were lucky to have him it's an understatement Chris is incredibly talented and, and incredibly accomplished. He's an Emmy winner. 
he, you know, uh, he won the Musician of the Year by the Association of Musicians in Hollywood over Hans Zimmer and over so many incredible, you know, uh, composers. Uh, it's just working with him was, was, a, was a dream and, and, and just how in incredibly talented he is. And I remember when he, when, he has when he was telling me about the idea of recording the musicians individually, I, 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 I think, I don't know, I think my blood pressure dropped immediately <laughs> on the phone. I was like, what are you talking about? It's like, no, there's no way we're gonna do this. And he's like, well, this is the only way to do it without getting sued. And, and I was like, you know, like with COVID, and it's like, and, but he said, don't worry, I got this, you know. I've done just this recently to Disney, I promise me, and trust me, that's, that's, it, is, it is going to work, you know. It is very difficult, but it's the safest way to do it, you know. And we care about, you know, the health of our musicians and, and everybody, but it's the way he came through, you know, uh, the way, you know, he was, he, he came about how to put the score together and, and being open to ideas and it's, uh, it's been in, in incredible and, and, you know, and he did few movies. I mean, the, the personal history of David Copperfield, you know, Death with Stalin, Veep and Black Mirror and, and uh, Schmegadoon, the, you know, the musical on Apple. And so, so, you know, he is very humble, but he's, you know, we're lucky to have him. And thank you so much for coming all the way from LA, Chris, to be oh, here with pleasure. us. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to be here. Thank you. Let's just say one other thing. Isn't, isn't it true that the, the soundtrack has been released? It's oh, not, yeah. And, and how did I forget about this? And this, uh, because the music is so stunning, uh, the score, we call it, uh, it was picked up by a record uh, label company in London. Uh, you know, last year and uh, or a few months ago, and it was just released. Uh, you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, so the album now is available on on Spotify and on Apple Music and everywhere. And and kudos to him and to his incredible music that was you know got you know a minimum four out of five in every I think newspaper and magazine that covered the music. And recently he made the cover magazine of Film Score with Lemieux's poem and they had 30 pages deep analysis into every track he created for this movie. You know, I'm, I'm blessed to, to, to be working, you know, with you, continue to working with you and to work with you on Lemia, Chris. I really appreciate it, thank you. So, Sam, you mentioned that hope comes from the wound in the heart where the light enters. Mm -hmm. I was just curious to you, what does that light represent? What does that light represent? Yes, so like the deeper meaning. I think that light represents life, and that light represents, uh, I think, a dream, dreams and, and existence. And that light, you know, represents the, you know, uh, generations that they are living in, in peace, generations that they they are within, you know, in peace with themselves. That light, I think, you know, uh, represents kids that they are not traumatized, uh, represents success. Uh, you know, like just to, if we're talking about like in particular, because Lemia, she's from Syria and it's, it's not just particular, you know, for Syrian refugee, but the stories that I keep on hearing from Syrian refugee who left that country when they were little kids and now they are, you know, college kids. If it's in Germany, if it's in Canada, if they are in France, or the success, uh, the amount of success that, you know, that I'm hearing and I'm getting, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, it's in the news actually about what they're accomplishing. This is, I think, the light that we're talking about. Uh, 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 these kids, they're gonna lead the world one day. These refugees, they're gonna be your, you know, uh, uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna be the, you know, the leaders of companies like Apple and Google, and they're gonna be hopefully the decent politicians that we're looking for. And they're gonna be actually that, that li the light we're gonna all, you know, that, that we all need to, to see through. That's the light that we're kind of like, we're, we're talking about. So I'm, I'm always hopeful, and I have to be hopeful. And, you know, if, if you have to have faith, and I think that light also represents faith. And we have faith that, you know, uh, that these, these kids, uh, no matter what they go through, and we're losing a lot of them, unfortunately, uh, but whoever, you know, holds into this, you know, that hope that's, and, and continue 
grinding and continue fighting and somehow manage to be somewhere where you know he or she you know safe i think one day we're going to see him leading this world to hopefully a, a better place